Are you ready to dive into the most dangerous waters on the planet? Just kidding. Please put your swimming gear back on the shelf, and trust me, it's much safer to look at them from a distance. Some of them are full of sharks, and others full of acid, and I don't even know what's worse. Probably the ones that are so deep and scary that many divers never come back for them. I'll let you choose your own top worst. If you've ever been to Texas in the summer, you know how hot it gets, and you'll be happy to jump into some ice-cold water without thinking too much. Brightly colored and a bit out of this world, Jacob's Well looks like the perfect place for that. Settlers first found it around the middle of the 19th century. They noticed a watering hole spouting water up to five feet and decided it would be a good drinking fountain. The well is 120 feet deep on average, and they believe it's the second largest fully submerged cave in Texas. So this well with the cool water lures in some brave folks who jump in from an outcropping nearby. I guess I'd skip on that one. What about you? Some divers go down a whole hundred feet and maneuver around the passages of the underwater cave. And they all say it's not a walk in the park. Several folks never come back from the well. And that's why they say it's one of the most dangerous diving spots in the world. All those underwater passageways become so narrow at one point that you can get stuck there with all the equipment. The second problem is that the cave is really deep. And it's dangerous even on the surface. It's only 12 feet in diameter and has rocks around it, so you can hurt yourself while flipping into it. And if all this wasn't convincing enough and you still want to go, you'll need special permission to do it. Now, Hanakapiaj Beach in Hawaii is exactly what comes to mind when someone says perfect beach, so I know you'll be tempted to go there, but in reality, it deserves to be listed in the dictionary under danger. If you still go there, you'll notice a wooden tally board showing the number of swimmers who never got out of the water. You'll see more than 80 marks, and it's an unofficial number, so there could be more. The source of danger here is extra strong rip currents and totally unpredictable high surf. There are no big reefs in the ocean in that area, so nothing stands in the way of strong currents. If you're feeling adventurous and still decide to go in the water and end up caught in a rip current, the nearest safe shore is around 6 miles away. So the chances of surviving are really low. Plus, the beach is so remote, there are no lifeguards around so it'll just be you against the ocean. And the ocean has more chances of winning. That's why Hanakapiaj isn't even fit for experienced swimmers and surfers. There is definitely no shortage of beaches in Hawaii, so you can choose something else for your getaway. Guri, or Fraser Island, if Guri also seems impossibly hard to pronounce for you, is teeming with diverse wildlife and stunning landscapes. But before you head off to this largest sand island in the world, let's talk safety. Dingoes roam the island, and they aren't your average golden retrievers from the neighborhood. These guys can be unpredictable and dangerous to humans if you provoke them. So you should never feed them or interact with them and keep your food and other stuff on you if you don't want to draw their attention. And trust me, you don't. The next threat is snakes hiding in tall grass. Visitors must stick to marked trails and watch out, especially at night. There are also some super venomous spiders around, and if you think you can hide from all that fauna in the water, surprise, surprise, great white and bull sharks will be waiting for you there. You can meet them if you go any deeper in the water than up to your knees. Plus, the currents are pretty strong here, and the ocean conditions can change quickly or seem calmer than they actually are. There are no lifeguards ready to save your life in case something goes wrong, so you're swimming at your own risk. And if you think you can just call for help using your phone, I wouldn't rely too much on getting good coverage here. The weather on the shore here also changes with no warning and brings sudden rainstorms, strong winds, and temperature ups and downs. Our next destination today is the Blue Lagoon. But don't get your hopes up, we aren't going to that gorgeous spa in Iceland, but to this UK version. Swimming here is like bathing in bleach. Not your favorite pastime? Mine neither. 
Authorities keep issuing warnings not to swim there. They call the once limestone quarry in Harper Hill probably the most dangerous water in the country. Those tropical-looking blue waters have high alkaline pH levels from limestone leaching. But it doesn't stop thousands of people from coming here during hot weather. Your skin, eyes, and stomach won't thank you for a visit here. You might also experience cold water shock or bump into one of the many objects that have been dumped in there over the years, from car wrecks to basic rubbish. In March of 2020, the situation got so bad that they even dyed the water of the Blue Lagoon black to deter prospective swimmers. In August of 2014, some locals found a lake in the middle of the desert in Tunisia. It gets really hot there, so I'm sure you'd also want to jump in there immediately. The new body of water got the nickname Mysterious Lake and actually became a great mystery. I hope you appreciate the pun. Hundreds of people came here to swim in the clear, cool water. But a few days later, the lake turned dark green. The locals didn't care about this and continued to bathe in it anyway. When scientists and geologists arrived at the place, they announced that the lake was stagnating. It didn't refresh itself from underground streams, and the rains didn't feed it either. That's how the water became moldy and dirty. The lake had some algae and a lot of harmful bacteria that are dangerous to the human body. Scientists also found out that the land in this region had phosphate deposits. This substance can decay. But even that didn't stop people from bathing in the lake in the middle of the desert. Where it came from is still a mystery. Some experts think that heavy rains have filled a hole in the ground with water. Another, more popular theory says that an earthquake had formed a lake. The seismic activity must have torn the Earth's crust above the water table, and then underground springs had filled the crevice. In theory, the lake could drain back out one day just as suddenly as it had appeared. So hurry up if you want to see it. Have you ever bathed in a diamond mine? I guess you're better off not trying it, especially if we're talking about the big hole in Kimberley, South Africa. 150 years ago, there was a flat-topped hill there. Then the news spread that someone had found big diamonds in the area. Thousands of people with picks and shovels rushed to the area. It became the largest hand-dug excavation in the world and one of the deepest. The mine was growing and water seeped into the pit and the rock from the walls moved down the slopes. They had switched to underground mining with tunnels and shafts. It became way too expensive, so they decided to shut down the mine after finding around 6,000 pounds of diamonds there. Now, the former mine is filled with roughly 130 feet of water. Swimming here is really dangerous because you can't see the bottom and the walls of this lake are too steep. So I guess you're better off taking your diamond rush elsewhere. Are you a pro swimmer? Brave enough to take a dip in any ocean or sea? Bad news. There are some places you should avoid no matter how well you swim or dive. Some of these places have dangerous underwater rocks, strong currents and tides. Others are famous for legends about monsters and mysterious creatures. So let's dive into this aquatic horror show. Have you ever heard the word the strid? It's a variation of the word the stride that is used in Yorkshire. And it refers to a narrow section of the river wharf that's so small you could jump over it. But don't be fooled by its size, it's one of the most dangerous spots around. Even taking a step into the water can have dire consequences. The river wharf has a forceful current. And since the strid is so narrow, it's even stronger in that area. The intense water flow has eroded the limestone around the strid, which created hollow spaces much deeper than the rest of the riverbed. Here's the secret. The current has also weakened the banks of the strid from below. So, the ground you're standing on, admiring the rapid flow, is probably just a fragile ledge hanging over treacherous waters. There's no record of anyone who found themselves in the water of the Strid and found their way out of it. And the worst part? You wouldn't even guess that this innocent-looking stream could be such a danger. 
So, my advice to you, my friend, is to stick to a safer body of water for your aquatic adventures. If you're looking for a weekend getaway in California, Horseshoe Lake is the spot for you. It's got everything. Sandy beaches, hiking trails, and picnic areas, but wait, there's more to it than meets the eye. This lake has a dark side, namely around 100 acres of dead trees that surround it. And it's not just the trees that have been claimed by this lake. The earthquakes that hit in 1989 and 1990 unleashed carbon dioxide from under the hot magma. The gas seeped out into the air, damaging all the life around the lake. Even now, Horseshoe Lake is just as dangerous as it was 30 years ago. What makes it so scary is that the levels of this toxic gas change randomly. Warning signs that are posted everywhere certainly could give a horror film touch to a fun hike in the woods. In Kauai, Hawaii, there's a group of stunning waterfalls that used to be a popular destination for tourists. Kipu Falls, as they're called, were once the go-to spot for swimming and diving. To get to them, you had to take a long walk along a dirt path until you finally arrived at a breathtaking view of a 20-foot waterfall pouring into a crystal clear pool below. But since 2011, this area has been off limits to the public. Why, you ask? Well, there have been a lot of accidents at Kipu Falls. Obviously, jumping off the top of the waterfall would be an obvious reason for that. But in addition, there were much more mysterious cases. Witnesses tell tales of swimmers peacefully enjoying the pool at the bottom of the falls, only to be suddenly dragged under the surface. No definite explanation was found to these accidents. The locals believe that the water spirit Mo'o is to blame because it doesn't appreciate being disturbed by loud tourists. There's also a theory of a powerful whirlpool at the bottom of the pool. In any case, guide publishers do not mention Kipu Falls anymore, and trespassing is severely punished. The Samizan Hole, located in the Gulf of Thailand, is the ultimate spot for thrill-seeking divers, but it's also the most dangerous one. With a drop of 280 feet, it's the deepest diving site in the region. But its depth is not the only reason it is considered a place to avoid. The area is a major shipping zone for giant oil tankers. The strong currents around the hole make diving even more treacherous. And if that's not enough, the Samisan Hole is also home to deadly barracudas that could easily attack unsuspecting divers. The water is so murky that visibility is nearly zero, making it challenging to spot these aggressive sea creatures. All in all, the Samisan Hole is a breathtaking but extremely hazardous spot that should only be explored by experienced divers with nerves of steel. Let me tell you about New Smyrna Beach, the shark attack capital of the world. If you're looking for a relaxing vacation spot in Volusia County, Florida, you may want to reconsider this beach. The waters around New Smyrna Beach are teeming with fish, which attracts a lot of sharks. In fact, there have been so many shark attacks reported in this area that it's earned the title of the shark attack capital of the world. Even scientists have warned that if you go for a swim there, you're bound to get up close and personal with at least one of these creatures. We are talking about a distance of 10 feet, and in many cases you wouldn't even notice it. To make matters worse, the bull shark, one of the most dangerous and aggressive types of sharks, has been spotted in these waters. Once again, Kauai is on our list. The beach on Nepali coast called Hanakapiai Beach might look like heaven on earth, but don't be fooled. To get there, you have to trek through a super steep, rocky two-mile trail. There are no lifeguards on this remote beach, so even if you decide to take a dip in the water, you're on your own. The biggest threat to your safety is the incredibly strong rip currents. They are almost always present because there are no reefs to shield the shore. And if someone gets caught in one, there's no safe place to swim to for miles. The nearest safe beach is six miles away. Trust me, this beach doesn't have the best track record in terms of safety. So it's highly advised that you stay out of the water if you end up at this beach. Let me tell you about a place that looks like it's straight out of a horror movie. We're talking about Berkeley Pit, which is an artificial lake situated in Butte, Montana. 
The first thing you'll notice about this place is that it has an eerie blood-red color that can only be described as unsettling. You might be tempted to take a dip, but that would be a grave mistake. Don't even touch it. The water is extremely dangerous due to the heavy metals present in it, such as cadmium, arsenic, zinc, lead, and copper. They come from the rocks that surround the lake and make the water super acidic. In fact, this place used to be an open pit copper mine, hence its color. So if you want my advice, avoid this place like the plague. There are three lakes in Africa that maybe are the most dangerous places of all that I have mentioned so far. They're all located in Africa. Lake Monoon and Lake Nyos in Cameroon and Lake Kivu in Rwanda are all like ticking timers ready to go off. They were formed over underground pools of molten rock. And sometimes this molten rock releases toxic gases like methane and carbon dioxide right into the water. When this happens, the gases can build up until they suddenly burst out of the water creating massive waves that can wipe out everything in their path. This type of outburst is called a limnic eruption, and it can release a cloud of poisonous gas that can be harmful to everything in the vicinity. The most terrifying part? These explosions can happen at any moment with no warning. So if you ever find yourself near one of these lakes, you'd better be on high alert, because you never know when the next accident might happen. Maybe you know other places you wouldn't recommend for a fun swim? Share your anti-recommendations in the comments below. Deep Dive Dubai is now the deepest pool in the world at 200 feet deep. The building on the outside resembles a giant oyster with pools and fountains, since the UAE has a deep-rooted culture for pearl diving. It may look like any regular pool on the surface, but down below, it's a marvel in engineering and planning. It's equipped with state-of-the-art gear and equipment for beginners and pros. You can either snorkel or dive the whole thing. The water is maintained at a constant temperature of 85 degrees Fahrenheit, which is ideal for diving and wearing all the gear and wetsuit. You won't have to worry about the cold temperatures typically found in oceans and seas. Each oxygen tank supplied can last anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes. Of course, a trained diver knows how to regulate each breath when swimming. The first few feet is meant for the warm-up and training, but after 100 feet below, the environment resembles a submerged city to explore, which requires some experience to embark. You can find anything from a furnished apartment building to a submerged car, which you can even sit inside. There are some interactive objects to fiddle around with, like a pool table and a chessboard. There is no marine life, since it's considered to be a swimming pool and not an aquarium. Building an aquarium would require a whole new approach to building, planning, and maintenance, which Deep Dive Dubai doesn't offer. The experience is even more surreal, knowing that there are people watching you from the outside. Anyone can sit in the restaurant and have some snacks, sandwiches, and icy cool drinks while viewing the underwater playground. The place has a gift shop to take some cool souvenirs home, and even a space to host meetings and conferences. Also, the staff will monitor you in case anything happens. Besides them observing you through the windows, there are 56 cameras installed around to make sure nothing bad happens. It's well maintained and monitored to ensure any diver's safety. The engineers built the pool in a concrete structure and installed the region's most advanced hyperbaric chamber with a capacity of 12 people for emergencies. It's also a good place for the divers to rest and catch a breath of fresh air, literally. The pool contains 3.9 million gallons of fresh water that gets filtered and circulates every six hours. The filtration system uses volcanic rocks and special technology developed by NASA. There are speakers from the top all the way down 50 feet, 15 to be exact. The speakers are used to create more ambiance while diving. It has underwater shutters that can close and open to make an even greater experience diving in complete darkness. But the pool has 150 lights to control the mood and atmosphere. It makes it feel like you're diving in a haunted cave. In such a case, they can provide you with a flashlight to see. In fact, after any dive, it's recommended to wait between 18 to 24 hours before going up to 1,000 feet. But there's no risk of doing the opposite. 
Deep Dive Dubai is equal to six Olympic-sized swimming pools, claiming the gold from Deep Spot in Poland. This deep pool is 150 feet deep, compared to Deep Dive Dubai's 200, and is meant as a training ground for divers of all levels. This giant pool cost almost $11 million from the ground up over the course of two years. It used an estimated 11,000 tons of steel to build, dethroning Italy's Y40 Deep Joy, which was the deepest pool in the world. The temperature is kept at a range between 32 degrees Celsius to 34 degrees Celsius, which is also perfect for diving in a wetsuit. It has a small shipwreck for divers to discover and artificial caves in various places to explore. It feels like swimming in a submerged Mayan ruins. The pool fits 27 times the amount of a regular swimming pool and has a glass tunnel connecting one end of the room to another. There's a lot of details put into the project that are visible when walking through it. Anyone can descend down the blue hole to test their diving skills, which is at the bottom of the pool. The place even offers an underwater hotel with a view of the interior of the pool from the rooms. And just like Deep Dive Dubai, the pool doesn't feature any marine life since it's not considered to be an aquarium. But it's open for everyone to learn the basics of diving or for thrill-seeking experienced divers. Nemo 33 is located in Brussels, Belgium and is also one of the deepest pools in the world. It was built in 2004 and took seven years to complete. It cost more than $3 million from start to finish and was designed by an engineer with diving experience. The pool uses more than 500,000 gallons of filtered spring water all the time. It's built to challenge your diving skills and even emulates the conditions of the sea and ocean. It has many simulations and obstacles to make it more fun and is perfect for beginners and pro divers. It was even used in Hollywood movies for underwater scenes. It's a great place to experience the sea without actually stepping foot inside. From the surface to the bottom is 115 feet, but you can reach depths between 15 feet and 30 feet if you want to take it easy. The pool has incredible built-in cave simulations to heighten the experience and make you want to come back for more. And just like the others, no marine life exists here as well. Time to step outside for sun in the largest pool in the world, City Star's Sharm El Sheikh. Located in the middle of the Sinai Desert, this area is known for resorts and touristic getaways. The pool is supplied with seawater and takes weeks to fill up the million square feet worth of water. It's not easy swimming in such a pool, but it's safe and sound. The second largest outdoor pool in the world is San Alfonso del Mar in Chile. It's around 60 miles away from Santiago in a town called Algarobo, which is a bustling tourist area. It's 20 times the size of an average Olympic pool at 3,200 feet long and more than 100 feet deep. The pool uses water from the Pacific Ocean and is constantly being pumped, filtered, and cleansed. 66 million gallons to be exact for a volume of 860,000 square feet. The engineers that designed this pool utilize pulses and ultrasonic filtration to keep the salt water purified. It's a good system since it doesn't require too much chlorine and electricity in the design. The pool is so big, you can literally sail from one side to another on a small sailboat or canoe. And once you anchor up, you can go to an actual sandy beach where you can enjoy the natural waves and the palm trees. Ik Kil Cenote is one of the most unique bodies of water that acts as a natural pool. Located in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, this place was historically important to the Mayans back then, but is now one of the most popular natural pools in the world. It was formed by a collapsing cave and created a 200-foot wide hole that's 115 feet deep. The water is crystal clear and is perfect for relaxing and escaping the crowd of a typical pool. You can either jump in and dive into the water, or you can descend down the ladder that's been carved into the limestone wall. I'll take the former, please. The enchanted river in the Mindanao Island in the Philippines is mysterious, yet charming, since no one knows about the creation of it. The color of the river stands out among all other rivers, ranging from aquamarine blue in the shallow regions to dark blue in the deeper ends. But in most cases, you can see the bottom of the river since the water is so clear. The river itself isn't that big to begin with and is close to the ocean. 
Some locals believe that this river is a home for spirits, and some areas are forbidden to swim in. But either way, this mesmerizing place is somewhere everyone should take a dip in. The concept of oil on troubled waters may seem like a strange expression, but its meaning of calming a tense situation is well understood. The origins of this phrase, though, have a much more literal explanation. It's true that even the roughest waves can be subdued by simple oil. Just like you dress your salad with oil to make it nicer, you can dress the sea to make it calmer. At the end of the 19th century, captains from various ships shared their experiences of using oil to calm rough waves in letters to the New York Times. One of those captains, Olsen of the Norwegian bark Wilhelmin, detailed what he did to save his crew and ship during violent storms. Despite the challenges they faced, the oil trick proved to be a game changer, drying up the weather side of the deck and helping them navigate through heavy gales. His words hinted at a secret power hidden within these simple bags made of sailcloth filled with irregular animal oil. He used it several times, and each time, the technique worked like a charm. One time, his crew encountered heavy gales on their voyage to Belfast. They were causing quite a stir, but they managed to stay ahead of the game by deploying these bags made of sailcloth filled with animal oil. As soon as they released the bag from the cat head, the weather side of the deck dried up in no time, even as the seas continued to wash over it. It was pretty neat to see it working its magic without even needing to check if the bag was empty, as it was a real lifesaver. Their vessel was still a little shaky and taking on water on the lee side, but this little trick really helped them out. Captain Jenkins from the British steamer Francisco used a similar method to calm the seas during their voyage from Hull, England to Boston. They ran into some strong westerly gales, causing really big waves. They didn't want to head any further north, so they decided to stop the engines and chill for a bit. They stuffed some oakum into the pipes of the closets and filled them with oil, and it worked like magic. The sea calmed down along the side of the ship, the big waves disappeared, and they stayed nice and dry. In total, 12 masters shared their success stories of using oil against rough waves, with only one reporting that it didn't work as expected. The use of storm oil, as sailors called it, was a tried and true method of preserving crew, cargo, and livestock from the harsh sea conditions. The toughest thing some of them experienced was just a little spray. Their methods were a tad different, but all of them used oil. But what made this storm oil so effective? First off, Let's clarify something. Storm oil is not your average supermarket olive oil. To be truly effective, storm oil must be made of that thick, next to water insoluble consistency. Technically, it acts like a surfactant. This practice is very old and has been used for many centuries. Since ancient times, people have poured oil to calm ocean waves. It was poured onto the ocean surface to reduce wave intensity making it easier for sea rescuers and navigation. This spilled oil accumulates on the surface and creates a concentration gradient that leads to extra dissipation and damping as waves move. In the past, steamships and lifeboats from various countries were required to carry storm oil as this practice continued until the late 20th century. It was included in the United States Maritime Service Training Manual as essential equipment for lifeboats and British vessels were mandated to have it until 1998. Often, vegetable oil or fish oil was used as a cost-effective option. While those options were commonly used as storm oil substitutes, the thick consistency was the key to the oil's effectiveness. Storm oil has a dampening effect on water, absorbing some energy from the waves. It quickly forms a thin layer over a large area of the water surface, preventing wind from creating waves easily. The use of oil to calm ocean waves dates back to ancient times, with Aristotle and Pliny the Elder discussing its effects. Benjamin Franklin famously studied the calming properties of oil on waves during his trips to England in the 18th century. Communication between Franklin, William Brownrigg, and Sir John Pringle led to further exploration of this phenomenon. 
Agnes Pockles also made significant contributions to the study of storm oils through her experiments in Germany. She suggested that the calming effect of oil on water involved more than just reducing surface tension. Oil is definitely a game changer when it comes to calming rough seas. But it's not just any oil that does the trick. You gotta use the right kind of oil and apply it the right way. Forget engine oil and other petroleum products, they won't do much. Fish oils are where it's at, especially the thick ones. The problem is, modern ships and boats don't really carry fish oils, so folks end up using engine oils and bunker oils instead. Not surprising that they don't see the calming effects they were hoping for. Back in the day, the Coast Guard used to carry a little tank of oil for rescue missions in choppy waters, but they stopped that practice ages ago. You can't just pour the oil on the water, you gotta let it leak out gradually, drop by drop. The best way is to hang a bag of cod liver oil or something like that over the side of the boat. The oil seeps out through the bag onto the water surface and smooths out the waves. Not only does the oil calm things down, but it also stops the wind from messing with the surface. Just a bit of the right oil, like a gallon or so, can flatten out a huge area around the boat. Believe it or not, tossing oil into the sea used to be allowed. Steamships and lifeboats were actually required to have equipment to slowly release oil during storms. The lifeboats on the Titanic fell under British law from 1894, which said they had to carry oil for bad weather. Now for the science part, as oil decreases water surface tension, preventing those pesky waves from breaking. It's like adding an invisible layer over the water that makes it super smooth. So, when you pour some oil into water, the molecules don't clump up as they spread out to form a super thin layer. These oil molecules kind of do a somersault, standing on their heads and aligning with the water molecules like magnets. This creates a film on the water surface that is just one molecule thick. You can actually figure out the size of a single oil molecule by trying this out. For instance, one tester used a spoon that was under half an inch high and the oil spot it spread out on the water was massive. If you do the math, you'll see that one molecule is incredibly tiny. Usually, wind creates waves by moving the surface of the water, but a layer of oil molecules acts as a barrier, stopping the wind from making waves and just pushing the oil around instead. This pretty cool trick has been used by all sorts of people throughout history for different reasons. I've already mentioned that Benjamin Franklin studied this phenomenon a lot, but he also liked to prank people by using this science. He would claim he could calm a choppy lake with just the touch of his cane. Turns out, he had a little vial of oil in the bottom of his cane that he could tap out onto the water surface. It made him look like some sort of magician or water-bending master. By the way, the science behind this trick is still used today. By putting a thin film of oil or smaller molecules like magnesium fluoride on glass, you can create invisible glass that reduces glare and reflection. This type of glass is used in smartphones, tablets, laptops, and glasses. Imagine a world where instead of water, the oceans are made of methane. Yeah, that's right. Instead of swimming in H2O, you'd be paddling around in CH4. It's like Mother Nature's version of a fizzy drink. Such oceans actually exist on one of Saturn's moons called Titan. In fact, the methane and ethane on Titan play a similar role to the water on Earth. They cycle through the atmosphere and form clouds that eventually rain down onto the surface. They were discovered by the Cassini-Huygens space probe. And apparently, our entire planet's oil reserves could fit in one of Titan's puddles. Even the desert sand dunes on Titan have more organics than all of Earth's coal reserves. Who knew that Titan was the place to go if you're ever in need of fuel for your car? Now, obviously, there are some things that distinguish methane lakes from our water ones. First, the temperature on Titan is around negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like taking a dip in a giant glass of liquid nitrogen. Not exactly ideal for a beach day, is it? Methane is also less dense than water. So if you were to go swimming in such an ocean, you'd float like a balloon. On the bright side, it would make doing the backstroke a lot easier. 
Next, while water waves can be pretty majestic, unfortunately, we can't ride any on Titan. Cassini didn't detect any big waves there. Maybe it's due to low seasonal winds, or the fact that some of the lakes are much smaller than Earth's lakes, but we don't know for sure. Also, I know what you're thinking. If the oceans are made of methane, could you set them on fire? Technically, yes. Methane is a highly flammable gas, so if you were to light a match in a methane ocean, you'd get a pretty impressive, but dangerous, blaze. So, given all these differences, the question arises, what would a planet with such oceans look like? Well, we can make some guesses by looking at Titan. First of all, its atmosphere, composed primarily of methane, would be incredibly thick. Titan's atmosphere reaches nearly 370 miles into space, and the atmospheric pressure there is 60% greater than Earth's. So, if you ever wanted to experience the feeling of swimming super deep in the ocean, now's your chance. Also, methane is a powerful greenhouse gas that traps the sun's heat really well. That's why our planet would warm up faster than a sauna. You may ask, why is it so cold on Titan then? This is because this moon is very far from the sun, and light doesn't reach it well. But if we place our planet somewhere in the middle, then the temperature may even be quite comfortable. Actually, methane oceans on a planet could really spice up the climate. The planet would be a breeding ground for methane clouds. Just like on Titan, it could form an orange-colored haze, or smog, that would make our planet look like a real mystery. It would be difficult to see us from space without some special telescopes. And let's not forget about methane storms. They would also occasionally drench the surface, so remember to bring your umbrella. But hey, at least the heavy, carbon-rich compounds would make for some pretty sweet dune fields. And finally, the most important difference. While water oceans on Earth are teeming with all sorts of creatures, we're not sure if there's any life in methane oceans on Titan. If there is, they'd have to be pretty tough to survive in such extreme conditions. So, if life on such a planet exists, it would be very different from what we're used to seeing on Earth. For example, microbes might be able to handle it. These tiny resilient creatures can survive in a wide range of environments, including extreme ones. So, it's possible that microbial life could exist in methane oceans. And what about us and animals? Well, scientist Robert Zubrin thinks that Titan might be the perfect place for humans to colonize in our solar system. According to him, this little moon has everything we need to survive and thrive. And if it's possible on that moon, then it could work with a planet too. For starters, we'd need some oxygen to breathe. We could use nitrogen and methane in the atmosphere to create breathable air and rocket fuel. We could also use these elements to make some fertilizers and grow plants. Next up, we'd need water. Since the oceans are made of methane, we can't exactly drink them. We'd need to find or create sources of water. Scientists believe that it actually may be hidden below the surface on Titan, together with some ammonia. We could use it to drink, or create even more oxygen. So, with all of these resources, we could create a self-sustaining colony even in a place with methane oceans. Piece of cake! Although, there are always alternatives. Maybe we could become methane breathers, evolve into organisms that use methane instead of oxygen. For example, we could get some large lungs because we'd have to inhale a much larger volume of air since methane is less dense than oxygen. But this is pure sci-fi. Methane oceans are not the only unusual oceans in space. It turns out that seas on diamond planets may be even weirder. Take WASP-12b, for example. This exoplanet, located about 1,200 light-years away, might have oceans of tar. That's right, tar. The planet has more carbon than oxygen, which means its crust is probably made of things like diamond and graphite, instead of your average silica-based minerals like granite. 
Imagine stepping on this planet, and the first thing you notice is that the beaches are made up of black goo. It's like stepping into a nightmare, where you're trapped in quicksand made of sticky sludge. So forget about the sandy beaches and crystal clear water you're used to. Here, you'll be living the pitch life. Your swimwear will be replaced with hazmat suits, and you'll need a sturdy pair of boots to walk on the sticky surface. But in reality, WASP-12b is not the place to look for geology of any kind. It's simply too hot for anything to survive, let alone thrive. But there might be smaller, similar exoplanets where we could potentially live. Now, you might be thinking, tar oceans? Eh, that's crazy talk. But did you know that there's a 246-foot deep lake of natural asphalt here on Earth? It's called Pitch Lake, and it's located in Trinidad. It's formed when oil is forced to the surface, and the lighter components evaporate, leaving the thicker, heavier pitch behind. And guess what? This lake is home to a thriving ecosystem of microbes. So if you want to live on such a planet, at least you won't be alone. You'll have plenty of company in bacteria, fungi that love to feast on carbon found in asphalt, and archaea that live on methane. And finally, there are oceans of molten rock. That's right. Imagine a world where the floor is lava isn't just a game, but a reality. Welcome to 55 Cancri E, a planet so hot that the entire hemisphere facing its star is covered in magma. It's like a scene out of a heavy metal album cover. But don't worry, the other side of the planet is slightly cooler, so you can at least step off the lava and catch your breath. If you're feeling adventurous, you could always hop over to Koro T7b, another super Earth where the lava ocean is just a scorching. But this time, the night side doesn't offer much respite either. It's still seeing constant volcanic eruptions, like some sort of firework show. Scientists are scratching their heads trying to explain why these planets are so hot and why they haven't cooled down yet. Maybe they're just really good at retaining heat or maybe they just have a bad temperament. Either way, it's probably best to stick to playing the floor is lava on solid ground and leave the real lava planets to someone else. All this diversity of oceans shows us that the universe is always full of surprises. It never ceases to amaze us with its creativity. Although these oceans are not suitable for human exploration yet, they challenge our understanding of what could exist beyond our world. So, let's continue to explore. Okay, here you are, in the middle of the ocean. It's endless, but you can't see it, because there's a thick fog all around you. Dense clouds hide the huge but dim sun. Is it day or night? You don't know. There's only a gray haze around you. You're alone. Even if you try to swim down, after several hours, you still won't be able to see the bottom of the ocean. And that's a typical water planet for you. I know, sounded kind of dark, but it's not that bad. These water worlds are more interesting than they may seem, so let's take a look at them. The ocean planet is a planet that consists, as you might have guessed, mainly of water, ice, and maybe some rocks. Think of the Earth's oceans. It's horrifying depths, the Mariana Trench, and all that. And now, can you guess how much space all the water on Earth takes up? 0.025%, exactly. Now, just try to imagine a world of 40 to 60% water. If you dive in there, the depth can exceed 60 miles. Compared to that, the 6 mile depth of our Mariana Trench sounds like nothing. And yeah, the pressure there will be enormous. It can reach up to 20,000 Earth atmospheres. Very crushing. Now, it may sound scary, but it still would be great to find out more about these planets. Fortunately, according to scientists' calculations, there may be a lot of such planets in our galaxy alone. Well, you don't have to go far. You can find these water guys even in our solar system. Not planets, of course, but moons. Jupiter has Ganymede and Callisto, and Saturn has Titan and Enceladus. The ocean can reach up to 30% of the mass of these moons. 
although it isn't clear whether these oceans are covered with a thick crust of ice. But we've discovered quite a few full-fledged ocean planets. This is because the conditions in which these planets may exist are very specific. For example, this planet should be somewhere 6 to 8 times larger than the Earth. If it's smaller, it'll have a rocky surface. But if it's bigger, it'll turn into a gas giant. At the same time, it must be in the habitable zone of its star. A little further, and the planet immediately turns into an icy giant or a cold super-Earth. So yeah, these guys are very picky. We first started exploring these planets back in the 1970s. However, since then, we found only a couple of them. But they're still very interesting. The first planet is Gliese 1214b. It was the very first ocean planet that we discovered. Initially, the scientists noticed only a small, dim dot. This dot turned out to be the red dwarf star Gliese 1214, an unremarkable, completely ordinary star that's five times smaller than our Sun and 300 times dimmer. Scientists wouldn't worry about it at all, but back in 2009, they noticed that this star had one single planet. And this planet turned out to be quite strange. This super-Earth was 2.5 times bigger than our Earth and 6.5 times heavier. But at the same time, it had a very, very small density and about the same gravity as our planet. In other words, there were almost no rocks and metals on it. But it wasn't a gas giant either. So there was only one option left. It was covered in water and ice. And that's how we discovered the first ocean planet. Well, actually, we can only assume that it consists of water. That's what the mathematical calculations say. In reality, this planet is quite confusing. It's difficult to explore, and so far, scientists haven't been able to find anything there. No hydrogen, no helium, no water, nada. That's because the outer layer of the atmosphere of this planet is very dense, and it perfectly hides its composition. But even so, it's probably a water world. Gliese 1214b is very close to its star. It's only 0.014 astronomical units away, which is less than the distance between the Moon and us. The year there lasts about 36 hours, and the temperatures, to put it mildly, are just wild. Scientists suggest that the average temperature there can reach 250 to 535 degrees Fahrenheit. Woo, that's hot! Remember the creepy description from the beginning? Well, actually, spending time on Gliese 1214b would be a little different. More like swimming in a steam boiler. Because of such gigantic temperatures, the ocean on the surface will be constantly in a state close to boiling without actually reaching it. So, imagine that you're descending to the surface of this planet, flying through clouds of steam. And then, you suddenly find yourself in the water. What? But when did it happen? Well, that's because the boundary between steam and water on Gliese 1214b will be very blurred. Of course, you won't be able to swim to the bottom of this ocean. But most likely, this bottom is covered with a very thick layer of so-called hot ice. It's like regular ice, but it doesn't really care about the laws of physics, so it just doesn't melt even at gigantic temperatures. And the thickness of this ice can reach as much as 3,000 miles. So that's it for the creepy Gliese 1214b. And not an Airbnb in sight. Now although we can't 100% guarantee that it's a water world, we still have another candidate for this position. A newly discovered planet called TOI 1452b. This planet, located in the Dragon constellation, is almost 100 light years away from us. It was discovered using the TESS telescope by a group of researchers from the University of Montreal. This planet also belongs to the class of super-Earths. It's 7 times larger than our planet, but 48 times heavier. Again, all this is at a very low density. Because of this, scientists have suggested that almost the entire planet consists of a giant ocean. Here, we were a little luckier. This world won't be just a giant puddle in some thick ice. On this planet, there's probably a rocky surface deep under the water, just like in a typical ocean. Don't get too excited, though. This ocean will certainly be very different from what we're used to. TOI 1452b also orbits a small red dwarf. And not even one, but two at once. At the same time, if the previous planet was close to its sun, then this one, on the contrary, is very, very far away. 
It's two and a half times farther from its stars than Pluto is from the Sun. And it moves at great speed. A year there lasts only 11 days. But we still don't know many things about this planet. We'll probably get some new information when scientists observe it from the James Webb Telescope. Well, that's it. Wait, did you expect something else? All right, all right, I know the question that bothers you the most. Can there be life? Well, this is a difficult question. We all know that water means life, and besides, these planets are in the habitable zones of their stars. So, potentially, yes, there might be life. Not some full-fledged civilizations, of course, but bacteria, fish, and some creepy giant monsters. I mean, you know, why not? However, this is very unlikely. Water alone isn't enough to create life, even though it's very important. There should also be some micro-elements and some minerals. And unfortunately, for most water planets, the composition will only consist of water and very thick ice. There won't be any minerals there. But don't give up. There's still some probability. First of all, there are meteorites and comets. They can bring the necessary minerals to the planet. The more often they crash into it, the higher the probability that they'll bring something like this into the ocean and thus create life. Secondly, TOI 1452b actually has these minerals. Yes, we don't know how deep the rocky bottom is located there. But if it exists, then surely something could have originated there. Let's hope that new research with powerful telescopes will allow us to find out the truth. And who knows? Maybe one day we'll be able to visit such a planet ourselves. A wanderer walking through a desert feels the scorching sun like never before. You can see him from afar thanks to his shining clothes. His long hoodie is covered with foil. It reflects sunlight and protects him from heat. The ground is so hot that shoe soles can melt on it. That's why the wanderer's boots are covered with heat-resistant material. A cloudless sky, barren land, and heat. But the wanderer is not in the desert. He's walking on the ocean's bottom. He doesn't know why this happened, but all the oceans on Earth dried up. It happened almost instantly, and even the greatest minds in the world don't know why. The wanderer knows only one thing. When it happened, his family was on the other side of the ocean for several months. He's been traveling across this lifeless land, and he won't stop until he finds his family. The landscape around is spectacular. People have finally found out the secrets of the ocean depths. The seabed consists of huge mountain ranges and volcanoes. They fell asleep forever after the water had disappeared. Also, there are huge trenches leading to the unexplored depths of the planet. People had to build bridges to get over these enormous cracks in the ground. But most of the ocean floor is flat plains, boundless, lifeless, merciless. The wanderers walking across a huge canyon. Once, it was swarming with sea life. The man puts on a gas mask, but not because of a sandstorm. Many fish and other marine inhabitants used to live in such canyons. Now, all that's left is a terrible smell. The wanderer passes by huge skeletons of whales. Among them, he notices dirty tents. People are hiding there from heat. The temperature in the area is much higher than in the Sahara Desert. One of the main functions of the ocean was to distribute heat all over the planet. The sun emits heat and radiation. The ocean absorbed this energy. Lots of currents were warm, and they carried this warmth around the world. The water got heated at the equator, then it evaporated and turned into clouds. When warm air rose, it pulled along colder air from below. This allowed the energy to be evenly distributed. In simple words, the ocean cooled hot places and brought warmth to cold ones. Now there's none of this. Every day the sun burns the equator and dries up the rest of the planet. The wanderer doesn't come close to the tents. He is carrying the most valuable treasure in the world and doesn't want people to notice him. The inhabitants of Earth are just trying to survive, and many have forgotten about such a thing as morality. Fortunately, the wanderer still remembers. The thoughts of the family help him remain a good person. Sometimes it complicates his life. Like now, for example. In the distance, he sees a young girl. She doesn't look well. There's no one around, and the wanderer decides to help her. Out of his backpack, he pulls a thing worth more than all the gold on the planet. A bottle of water. 
The girl takes a few sips, but instead of thanking the wanderer, she starts screaming. It's a trap! Her accomplices appear from different sides. Looters. They're gonna take everything. The wanderer runs away. He hasn't eaten for several days, and his strength is leaving him. He won't be able to keep going much longer. The marauders are closing in on him. The wanderer throws the bottle aside. His pursuers rush to the water like crazy. They forget about the mate and fight one another for the bottle. The chances of the wanderer's survival have greatly decreased. He could make this bottle last at least several days. Plus, he's also lost a lot of fluid because of running. In the beginning, there was no panic because of a lack of water. The ocean dried up, but its waters were salty anyway. People still had seas, lakes, and rivers. But the problem was that the ocean was feeding them. When the ocean water evaporated, it formed clouds. These clouds moved all over the world and enriched lakes and rivers with rain. Now, there are almost no clouds. The sun started heating Earth much more. Lakes and seas dried up alarmingly quickly. At that moment, real chaos began. The sun is going down on the horizon. Sunset is near. It's not so hot anymore. The exhausted wanderer continues walking. In the distance, he notices something that makes him stop, take out a small shovel, and start digging quickly. There's no shelter around, just a flat plain. The wanderer speeds up, otherwise it might be too late. The pit is finally ready. The man jumps down and covers his head with a cloak. A few seconds later, a strong ash storm passes through the entire plain. The smallest particles of ash can penetrate through clothes and get into the lungs. The wind is so strong that it can knock anyone down. When the oceans dried up, the sun began to burn the surface of the planet. This led to massive forest fires. The flames destroyed almost all the trees. Huge clouds of carbon dioxide and ash formed. Driven by the wind, they travel the world and poison everything around. The wanderer is sitting in the pit while a terrible hurricane is sweeping over his head. He thinks of his family and slowly falls asleep. Cold wakes him up. Frosty air chills him to the bone. So it's night now. The wanderer climbs out of the pit and finds himself under bright stars. As soon as the water dried up, almost all clouds disappeared. Factories stopped working. Cars no longer emitted carbon dioxide. Thanks to this, Comets and the most distant stars can be seen in the sky. The Wanderer has seen them a thousand times, but he's still not used to the breathtaking picture. It's like he's looking at the sky through a telescope. An icy gust of wind brings the Wanderer back to reality. He won't survive the night if he doesn't find a warmer place. Before, nights were warmer thanks to the energy of the ocean. Now, as soon as the sun goes down, temperatures drop dramatically. The wanderer needs to move to stay warm. He starts walking faster. Soon, he notices some lights in the distance. It's probably other looters. The wanderer goes deeper into the valley. Stars in the moon illuminate his way. Unfortunately, he is running out of energy. He pulls a protein bar out of his pocket, but he needs at least a bit of water to eat it. To digest food, your body needs liquid. If the wanderer eats the bar, he'll only get thirstier. He can't walk and falls to the ground. He checks his pockets and finds a small kerosene tablet. He lights it using a matchstick. A tiny flame protects him from cold. To distract himself from thirst, the wanderer takes out an old MP3 player. He charged it during the day using the solar panels on his backpack. The man puts on headphones. Classical music calms him down. He lies on the ground next to the burning tablet. He needs to gain strength to continue his journey tomorrow. It's morning. In an hour, the sun will start burning the ground again. It's crucial to find water while he still has some time left. The wanderer inspects the territory and notices a spot where the ground is darker. In his previous life, the wanderer worked as a surveyor. He takes a few steps and touches the ground. It feels cool. There's an underground spring here. He begins to dig. The ground is getting wet. Water starts seeping out of the soil. The wanderer fills his empty bottles. Things don't look that bad anymore. It's getting a bit more difficult to breathe with each new day. In the past, phytoplankton and algae produced up to 70% of all the oxygen on the planet, but not anymore. Several days have passed. 
the wanderer runs out of water and food again. Fortunately, not for long. He's now walking among huge sunken ships. He sees modern aircraft carriers, liners, and even ancient pirate boats. In the distance, he spots huge mountains. The tops of these rocks are what used to be called the shore. The ocean floor is ending. The thoughts about reuniting with his family give him more strength. The man reaches the top and finds himself in the middle of a ruined city. It's empty. Where have all the people gone? Where is my family now? The wanderer asks himself. The man walks through the abandoned streets and meets an old man. He says that almost all the people who used to live here left the city and went to Antarctica. The wanderer has a new goal. He's going to get to the icy mainland no matter what. He will find his family. What do you think lies at the bottom of the ocean? What if I told you that, together with the remains of the Titanic and other mysterious underwater animals, ocean floors have buried over 20 million tons of gold within them? Crazy, right? As it seems, that gold is of difficult extraction, and nobody has attempted to dig it out. But if it were to be extracted, each human alive on the planet could be gifted 9 pounds of gold. Now, would you imagine that? In 2016, during an auction at a large fish market in Tokyo, Japan, an endangered species of bluefin tuna was sold for 14 million yen, which is the equivalent of more or less 117,000 US dollars. And that wasn't even the most expensive fish ever sold. As it appears, bidding on fish has become sort of a tradition at the Skigi. Am I pronouncing this correctly? Anyways, at this famous fish market in Japan. The first auction of the new year attracts bidders from all over the world to place their bets in the hopes of buying rare species of fish. Now, apparently, the bluefin tuna ranks as one of the most expensive fish out there today. It weighs around 989 pounds. Back in 2019, a single one was sold for a mind-boggling price of $3.1 million, the highest amount anyone has paid for a fish so far. If we do the math, that means one pound of bluefin tuna costs around 3,600 bucks. Who knew fish could be that expensive? A recent study conducted in 2011 showed that a single reef shark in Palau, an island nation in the Pacific Ocean, would have an estimated life value of nearly $2 million. This value is based on the number of tourists that reef sharks attract to dive sites. That's pretty neat. There is no doubt that the ocean is full of riches. It may seem crazy to think about nature this way, but if someone wanted to buy all the ocean water and everything inside it, do you have any idea how much it would cost? Is that price even measurable? Well, according to research published by the World Wildlife Fund in association with the Global Change Institute from the University of Queensland, the net worth of the ocean is indeed quantifiable, and there are reasons why that is so. But before we reveal the price tag, let's try to understand the scope of what we're talking about. Now, oceans occupy over 70% of the Earth's surface. They carry around more or less 320 cubic miles of salt water. For scale, it would take around 800 trillion Olympic-sized pools to fill all the water in the ocean. 800 trillion. Now, that's a lot of swimming pools, I'll give you that. The ocean occupies over 99% of the Earth's total living space. That's almost our entire planet. If that doesn't sound right, do you have any idea how deep oceans are? We could probably fit all the cities of the world down there, and there would still be ample space left. Some say that if you took Mount Everest, turned it upside down, and tossed it on one of the ocean's deepest ends, it still wouldn't reach the seabed. There would be a little over a mile left to reach the ocean floor. The truth is, we know very little about our oceans. Much more money and effort has been dedicated to space travel. For instance, isn't it funny to think that even though we are 239,000 miles away from the Moon, and even further away from Venus and Mars, the surface of these planets has been almost 100% photographed and studied by modern scientists? How much of our seabed would you guess we've mapped so far? Well, what if I told you that we've charted only 5% of all seafloors? Crazy, right? 
It gets even crazier if we think that over 94% of all living beings are actually aquatic creatures, and so many of these we have no idea about. Some say that the ocean is the final frontier of humankind. And it is true that very few people have ventured down into the deep waters. We've sent over 12 men to walk the moon, but no more than 4 men have attempted to dive all the way down to the deep, deep sea. For example, does the name James Cameron ring a bell? Who here still hasn't watched Titanic? Well, Cameron was the director of the blockbuster movie Titanic, and some years after he shot it, he took part in one of the two manned expeditions ever to go down to Challenger Deep. Now, Challenger Deep, as the name suggests, is one of the furthest points at the bottom of the ocean. It's located deep within the Mariana Trench. Cameron decided he wanted to be the first man to arrive at the deepest point of the ocean, and so he did. Now, prior to him, Challenger Deep had only been reached by Jacques Picard and Don Walsh back in the 1960s. But Cameron managed to travel even farther down than the previous expedition. He was the first one to have touched the astounding depth of 35,787 feet below the surface. Even more shocking is to know that the submersible he rode on to arrive at such depth cost him around $10 million. The expedition itself cost half that, adding up to a total of $15 million to satisfy his wish. But none of this compares to the final price for shooting the movie Titanic, which arrived at an estimate of $200 million back in 1998. Did you know that the ocean actually grows in size? I mean, it's already huge, and it has no plans of getting smaller. According to research, the Atlantic Ocean grows 2 inches bigger every year. Now, how could we ever put a price tag on something so unique and essential to life as the ocean? According to the World Wildlife Fund, measuring the price of the ocean is a way of bringing awareness and attention to one of the world's most precious jewels. This type of measuring happens through what is called ecosystem valuation. There are normally two ways of deciding how much something costs. One is through market valuation, and the other is non-market valuation. Imagine that. Which means that someone goes around asking other people how much they would hypothetically pay for something, in this case, the ocean. And then later, economists do some type of crazy calculation and arrive at an estimated price. They try to factor in all of what we've mentioned before. The astronomical price of bluefin tuna, for example. The life value of a shark. Maybe they even asked James Cameron how much he would pay for all of the ocean. Well, jokes aside, the non-market price they arrived at for the ocean was $24 trillion. According to this estimated price, the ocean is worth more or less the same amount as the GDP of a few powerhouse countries of the world. If compared to the world's top 10 economies, the ocean would rank number one with an annual value of $24 trillion. If we were to dig a little deeper, this would mean that one cubic mile of water from the ocean costs $13. Well, that's a little more affordable, isn't it? Even if it is highly valued economically, oceans are essential not only to human life, but to the majority of the world's animal and fish population. Life on Earth would be impossible without ocean water, which is why it is so important to make it highly accessible. It's not like we need a spaceship to visit the nearest ocean. Depending on where you live on the globe, a few hours drive or a short stroll and you're there. If you were asked how much you would hypothetically pay for all of the world's seabed, how much would you consider paying for it? A few trillions as well? Tell us in the comments below. If you learned something new today, then give this video a like and share it with a friend. We have over 2,000 cool videos for you to check out here. And remember, stay on the bright side of life. Well, I think we all realize that something strange is going on with the oceans when those creepy creatures start popping up. A fish with a long, bony stick growing out of its head. A creature that looks like a pulsing pile of spaghetti. A white shrimp the size of an adult's palm. A toothy fish with glowing ribs. A huge sea beetle the size of a cat. A purple jellyfish that looks like lava. Some people call them monsters. Some are sure they come from another planet. Fortunately, scientists quickly calm people down. 
These creatures are inhabitants of the deepest parts of the sea and have always lived here. Something's forced them to come to the surface. In the Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of Antarctica, a research ship gets into trouble. A block of ice breaks off from a large iceberg and falls onto the deck of the ship. Severe frost, icy water, an impending storm, there's almost no chance of salvation. Waiting for rescuers is impossible. It'd be days before they're found. Several crew members fall overboard and find the water is… Ah, that's weird. The water's warm. Thanks to this, the crew manages to hold out much longer. And they get rescued after all. Hmm, all the oceans begin to warm up. Normally, water's heated very slowly from the outside, from the sun, greenhouse gases, you know, that sort of thing. Even a tiny increase in temperature means big problems. Now, the ocean is heating up quickly and from the inside, from the bottom. Scientists send down one of those deep water research things, which can handle high temperatures and pressure. The deeper down it goes, the fewer living organisms they see swimming around. Almost at the bottom, the water becomes very hot. Scientists spot a crack in the Earth's crust. It's like a volcano, only flat. The hot energy of the Earth's core spills out and heats the ocean. Life down there quickly becomes impossible, so all the deep-sea creepy creatures start to swim up to the surface. The world's oceans are basically still a mystery. Whatever unknown animals were lurking in its depths, they're all swimming around on the surface now. Huge squid, the size of a bus, appear out of nowhere and attack ships. That kraken myth's not sounding so crazy now. Oceanographers discover new species of animals every day. But hot water isn't the only thing forcing all these beings out of the darkness. There's not enough oxygen in the ocean now, as warm water has way less oxygen in it than cold. Following the monsters from the depths, hundreds of thousands of whales, dolphins, sharks, and ordinary fish swim to the surface. All the rich life of the underwater world floats close to the shores to get at that precious oxygen. People can't step foot on the beach anymore, at least not in the water. Who would dare to take a dip in the ocean if there's a chance of meeting a humongous squid or a hungry shark? Yikes! Crabs and turtles come ashore. The struggle for food begins amongst all sea creatures. People don't exactly just sit by doing nothing. Fishing goes into overdrive. Of course, fishing like that can't last forever. Hot water quickly evaporates on the surface of the oceans. The massive amount of water vapor turns into huge rain clouds. The wind drives the clouds inland, and epic rains begin to fall on cities and towns everywhere. It's been raining all day. A powerful river of water is flowing down the street outside your apartment, taking cars, mailboxes, and trash along for the ride. You're a glass-half-full kind of person, so surfing time! The next day, the rain continues. And the next one, too. The ground floor of every building is underwater. It's like a new sewer system. That means the streets aren't just filled with rainwater, it's way nastier than that. Luckily, the rain's finally ending. The water's slowly receding, but there's another disaster ahead. Thanks to all that hot air caused by the warmer oceans, Tornadoes, typhoons, and hurricanes become a daily nightmare. Strong winds blow off roofs and ground all air traffic. Windows don't stand a chance. People are mostly hiding in their homes, hoping that everything will end soon. But this is just the beginning. The hurricanes calm down. You can step out onto a deserted, wrecked street and notice a large shadow. It's getting bigger and bigger. You turn around and see a giant wall of water. A huge tsunami is bearing down on you. You run back inside and head for what's left of the roof. The gigantic glaciers of Antarctica have been melting because of the hot ocean. Water levels are rising all over the world. Huge tsunamis are everywhere, flooding coastal cities in every continent. The landscape of the planet is changing. Millions of years ago, almost all the world's deserts were actually at the bottom of seas and oceans. Now it's happening again. Tsunamis are replaced again by new rains and hurricanes. Humanity begins to accept that life on Earth will never be the same. The biggest human migration in history is already underway. Flooded megacities are empty. 
being able to swim becomes essential for survival. You and other people manage to survive on small bits of land, far enough from the water that hurricanes and tsunamis aren't that bad. Some settle in the mountains, which now just look like small islands surrounded by lifeless water. Life is slowly getting better. You get used to the endless downpours and frequent moves. But there's a new problem. More than half of the oxygen on the planet comes from seaweed and photoplankton. These organisms use the sun's rays to convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. Now, because of the hot water, they're all gone. Most of the forests and fields are flooded. The Earth's atmosphere is losing its enormous reserves of oxygen. It's getting hard for people to breathe. Oxygen is really crucial for your mind to work properly, not just your body. You move more slowly. You can't make smart decisions. You forget where you're going and why. Makes it kind of hard to solve all your huge problems. But the Earth is awesome at adapting. Pretty soon, the planet's ecosystem starts to get back in balance. The water in the oceans is still hot, but not everywhere. In some parts of the world, new seas have formed. Thanks to the melting glaciers, the water in these seas is nice and cold, and seaweed reappears. The air gets filled back up with oxygen, and you take your first deep breath in ages. Ah, <sighs> But the endless rains keep coming. And it's not just the ocean getting hotter, it's also the atmosphere. Those life-saving new seas start evaporating. There are completely lifeless spots on every continent, full of hot water and hot air. But people aren't running out of water. There's a steady supply from the melted glaciers, which are mostly not salty, so score! In place of Antarctica, there's now a freshwater fifth ocean. Or is it a sixth ocean? I can never remember. Marine life adapts to the new conditions. Pretty soon, there are fish everywhere. Now people have access to nutritious fish and algae. Some people don't want to bother with the constant flooding and just decide to live on the water all year round. They build large cruisers, complete with apartments, schools, gyms, restaurants, shops, and a whole lot of sushi. You decide to go on a trip around the world, and now's the best time to do it. You can actually sail over flooded cities. Sometimes you can even see the tips of skyscrapers sticking out through the water. More and more people decide to spend their lives wandering the oceans. The cruisers get bigger and bigger. Then, people start combining ships to create enormous floating cities. There's a rush for the new tech that can help us live underwater. Half of humanity ends up living under the sea. But there are still epic problems. Scientists need to get in gear and figure out how to stop the oceans from overheating. It's even starting to boil in some places. That means, in the future, water reserves will evaporate and the oceans slowly dry up. Engineers create huge cooling filters and install them all over the planet. It's not going to fix everything, but it'll make enough cool water for us to survive. Fast forward a thousand years, and some oceans are bone dry. That means new continents. The nonstop rains almost stop. Whatever cracks opened up that heated up the oceans have sealed themselves back up. The planet survived, but it's got a serious makeover. In some places, the ocean floor has been transformed into cities, farms, and forests. Where there's still water, the hot new pastime is underwater excursions. Want to swim through Times Square or take a scuba selfie by the clock on Big Ben? Hey, go for it! Not a lot of people have heard of this mysterious body of water named after famous English explorer Sir Francis Drake. Even though Drake himself never sailed through these waters, one of his ships did pass near this location and discovered a connection between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. That's how the area got named the Drake Passage in 1578. Soon enough, the passage became known for some mysterious disappearances. It got the reputation of being the roughest and most unpredictable stretch of water in the world. It's now known for its strong winds and rough seas with waves that can reach up to 60 feet in height. The passage also has powerful currents with speeds never seen before. Does it sound like a good start to an adventure book? Sure, it doesn't make the place any less real. If you ever decide to travel between the southern tip of South America and the southern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, 
you will come across the infamous Drake Passage. We call this place the Drake Passage today, but locals still believe it should be named after Spanish explorer Francisco de Oces. He was a Spanish navigator who, in 1525, led the first known European expedition to navigate the Drake Passage. The trip was part of an attempt of Spain to find a new route to the Spice Islands in the East Indies. Oses and his two ships, the San Lesmes and the Santiago, sailed through the Strait of Magellan and into the Drake Passage, where they encountered treacherous weather and rough seas. Despite the difficulties, they successfully navigated the passage and became the first Europeans known to have done so. However, the expedition failed to find a new trade route, and the crew returned to Spain with no significant discoveries. Some years later, in 1616, another ship captained by Dutch navigator Willem Schouten made one of the most successful voyages through the Drake Passage. Despite the difficulties of navigating the often turbulent seas, eventually, the Drake Passage became an important part of international trade routes in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But this dangerous area holds many secrets. The record of one of the most famous events that happened here takes us back to the year 1914. During that time, a British explorer named Shackleton wanted to travel to Antarctica with 27 men split between two ships. Those were named the Endurance and the Aurora. The explorers wanted to check out two routes that reached the continent. But in 1915, the Endurance got stuck in ice while crossing the Drake Passage and was slowly crushed. Shackleton and his crew had to leave the ship and could only gather some personal belongings. The Endurance eventually sank and the crew had to survive on ice for a while. The mission changed from exploring to surviving and only in 1916 all the men were rescued. The Aurora suffered a similar fate. It also got stuck in ice and three men were lost at sea before the rest of the crew was rescued in 1917. For many years, the ship Endurance was thought to have been lost forever. But in 2022, a group of specialists went on a trip to find it. They left from Cape Town, South Africa on February 5th. The leader of the group said it was most likely the most difficult shipwreck search in history. They used special equipment to find the ship under the water and then used a special underwater camera to take a closer look. The members of the team were sure they had found the Endurance because it was in a place where very few ships had ever been. Despite being 10,000 feet underwater, the Endurance didn't look so shabby. It was actually pretty well preserved for a ship that had been underwater for more than 100 years. The explorers were still even able to see the word Endurance written on it. But it's not just ships that have a hard time with the Drake Passage. A plane with 38 people on board seemed to have disappeared over the Drake Passage in 2019, according to the Chilean authorities. It's believed it hit the icy and rough waters of the passage. Rescuers used ships, planes, and satellites to search for the missing plane and its passengers in the area where it had last sent messages. But the harsh conditions of the Drake Passage made the search very difficult. The exact location where the accident had happened was eventually found, but there were no survivors. The Viking Polaris is another of those ships that got damaged in the passage, even though it was designed for tough conditions. It was faster than most ships and more stable because of special equipment that kept it balanced. One night, back in 2022, the waves were indeed big, but the ship seemed to be doing well in the rough weather. But then, on its way back to port in Ushuaia, Argentina, a rogue wave suddenly hit the ship without warning. People on board felt like they had been hit by an iceberg. Rogue waves are much taller than other waves around them, and they're very unpredictable. Scientists still don't know exactly why they occur. When this rogue wave hit the Viking Polaris ship, it immediately broke windows on the second deck. Some people on board were hurt, but thankfully, most of them had been properly trained before boarding the ship and knew what they had to do in case of an emergency. The crew was also very good at helping the passengers. Most of them even claimed later that they would board the ship for the second time, despite such an unexpected experience. The boat eventually made it to the port without suffering further damage. What makes this region so hard to cross, though? For starters, the Drake Passage is a wide and deep area of water. It's about 500 miles wide and has a depth of 15,000 feet. 
even the most experienced sailors who cross the passage every year say it can be dangerous, unpredictable, and even scary at times. And that's even considering the modern technologies we have today. The area is a mix of warm and cold temperatures, which can result in ravishing storms. Strong winds from the west push the water from the Pacific Ocean into the passage, creating waves and swells that can reach up to 30 feet or more. If accidents happen here, things can get ugly faster than anywhere else. The Drake Passage is a part of the ocean where the water is very cold and has strong currents. The bottom of the ocean there is also not stable, making it harder to find things like a plane or a ship. These days, we have modern technology that helps us feel safe, even when we're passing through rough seas. However, if you are planning to travel by boat to Antarctica, make sure you're ready for the rough sea in the Drake Passage and for feeling a little uneasy. This can happen even to the most experienced of people when the waters are rough, but it's especially tough if it's your first time. Some people bring remedies to avoid feeling sick, like ginger gum or scented wristbands. Others find it helpful to look at the horizon. Test things out to see what works for you. Once you arrive at the Drake Passage, you'll be surprised to see that lots of different animals live there. You can see many types of dolphins, birds, whales, and penguins. The water in the Drake Passage is also good for small animals like plankton, krill, which bigger animals such as whales, penguins, and seals generally have on their daily menus. As you get closer to Antarctica, watch out for the South Shetland Islands. These might be the first pieces of land you'll see. They're also located in the Antarctic Peninsula and were first discovered in 1819 by British explorer William Smith. The South Shetland Islands are home to severe active volcanoes, including Deception Island and Mount Fenton. The islands are also where you can find a number of endemic species, including the South Shetland Islands Gen 2 penguin, which is only found on this piece of land. Our solar system might have some more planets up its sleeve. We know about eight official planets, but they're not the only ones that survived the chaotic formation of our solar system 4.5 billion years ago. Astronomers say there are three categories of planets in our solar system. We're in the first one, the four rocky inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, that peacefully orbit the Sun. They're located within the main asteroid belt that separates Mars from Jupiter, which is in category number two. That one's a group of planets in the outer solar system, the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. These planets have huge amounts of ice and gas around what scientists believe to be their rocky cores. The third group lies beyond the area where our local planets are, somewhere further than Neptune. It's the realm where you'll find dwarf planets such as Pluto, Eris, and Sedna, and many smaller space bodies like comets. But new findings say there could be something else lurking in the dark besides dwarf planets and tiny space bodies. Maybe even a new planet! Models scientists made say that our solar system used to have one or more rocky planets the size of Mars or Earth. Over time, these rocky wanderers interacted with the wide gravity fields of our gas giants. This kicked them into a far out orbit, away from the neighborhood. The question is if one of those Mars-sized planets survived and could really be somewhere out there. Scientists have made simulations to see what potentially happened. These showed that in half of such cases where planets interact with the gravity of gas giants, they get ejected into interstellar space. In the remaining half, there's this one rogue planet left in an orbit similar to the ones the Kuiper Belt objects are following. There's only one thing left to do now. Find it. Astronomers found the loneliest planet in the universe. They were trying to find distant brown dwarf stars, or failed stars, ones that never become massive enough to start shining. Stars are born with big masses, which means they also have strong self-gravity. The star squeezes in on itself. That causes high internal temperatures and enables the star to shine. But instead, they found a lonely wanderer, CFBD SIR 2149. The planet is between 50 and 120 million years old and has a surface temperature of 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Compared to stars, that's cold. At first, scientists thought it could be a brown dwarf star, but in that case, it would be way older. 
This starless planet floats around through space, passing only 130 light years away from our planet. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is 100,000 light years wide, so that's relatively close. The Lonely Traveler is actually a gas giant, four to seven times bigger than Jupiter. Maybe it was kicked out from its own solar system because of gravitational forces, or getting into another planet's orbit, or it was formed away from its parent star. Far beyond Pluto, on the edge of our solar system, there's a space body about as big as Pluto, but a little bit colder and way denser. It's probably a big rocky body covered in a thin icy mantle. It's the dwarf planet Eris. Both Pluto and Eris occupy the Kuiper Belt, which is the distant ring of frigid space bodies that lies beyond Neptune. A day there lasts 25.9 hours, pretty similar to Earth. But Eris circles our Sun in the distance three times farther than Pluto, which means its year is pretty long, 557 Earth years. Eris has a bright, icy surface. It's one of the most reflective bodies in our solar system. It bounces back more than 95% of the light that strikes it. Somewhere out there, even farther, there's a super Saturn, J1407b, much larger than Jupiter or Saturn. It's an exoplanet, which means a planet that orbits a star other than our Sun. Super Saturn is 434 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Centaurus. It's the only exoplanet we know about with rings similar to Saturn. It actually has a huge ring system, 200 times bigger than Saturn's rings. There are more than 30 rings, each of them tens of millions of miles in diameter. There are gaps in the rings, which means there could be some interesting satellites, exomoons, around. If this super Saturn could swap places with our regular Saturn, its rings would absolutely dominate our sky. You could look up and easily see them. The view would be amazing, because they would appear much bigger than a full moon. Scientists have found thousands of planets outside of our solar system. Some are dense as iron, while others are airy and light. And then there's the water world, GJ1214b, a steamy world, bigger than Earth and smaller than Uranus, 40 light years away from us in the constellation of Ophiuchus. It's a watery planet surrounded by a thick atmosphere, 2.7 times Earth's diameter and almost seven times heavier than our home planet. It was most likely formed somewhere farther from its star, where there was plenty of water ice, but later migrated to where it is today. Its surface temperature is 440 degrees Fahrenheit, which is too hot to host life like on Earth. It also has much less rock and much more water than our planet. Imagine a planet with no land, but only endless oceans covering all of its surface. High pressures and temperatures would form things like superfluid water or hot ice some pretty exotic materials that we can't see on our planet. Gliese 436b. It's a Neptune-sized exoplanet 30 light years away from our planet in the constellation of Leo. It makes one full orbit around its star in a little more than two days. This planet defies the laws of physics. It orbits its star, Gliese 436, which is smaller, cooler, and less luminous than our sun, at a distance 15 times closer than Mercury is to the sun. When we typically think of ice, we picture a frozen cube. But this planet has an icy surface, even though the temperature there is 980 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature is way above the melting point, but the ice remains solid and burning hot. This happens because of very strong gravity. It compresses the water vapor in the atmosphere into solid ice. The pressure here doesn't allow the ice to melt, no matter how hot the surface is. Now imagine being on a mysterious planet and it suddenly starts raining sapphires and rubies. One distant exoplanet, Hat P7b, a gas giant 1,000 light years away from Earth in the constellation of Cygnus and 16 times bigger, has specific weather and pretty violent storms. Rubies and sapphires are scattered across the planet when it's raining. On the planet's night side, there's a high amount of corundum in the atmosphere. And corundum is what mineral gems such as sapphires and rubies are made of. Clouds of corundum give such an amazing view. The planet is plagued by severe winds that often turn into powerful storms that push huge masses of those clouds across the planet. Although the planet is uninhabitable, it would certainly be cool to come there and pick up some gems. Still, 
the weather is pretty wild. Plus, the temperatures are over 4,600 degrees Fahrenheit. By comparison, Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, and its temperature is only 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Looking over the expanse of space, you can see a beautiful little blue dot in the endless darkness. It's an exoplanet, HD 189733b, that lies 63 light years from us in the constellation of Volpicula. But it's way hotter and larger than our planet, around the size of Jupiter, and it completes its orbit around its host star in only 2.2 Earth days. That orbit is so close that the planet is most likely tidally locked. That means it's always showing only one face to its star, like our moon always shows one side to Earth. The weather here is crazy. The winds blow at up to 5,400 miles per hour, which is seven times the speed of sound. The fastest wind on Earth only hit the mark of 230 miles per hour. And it gets better. The rain here is not made of water, but of molten glass. Clouds are made of silicate atoms and particles. They are the key element that gives the planet its cobalt blue color, not the reflection of oceans, which is the case with Earth. Earth used to be purple. Today, even when you look at our planet from space, you see a lot of green. The green we see in nature is there because of photosynthesis, the process where plants transform energy coming from the sun into energy they need to live and to produce oxygen for us. The main part of the process that gives plants the green color is the chlorophyll pigment. A long time ago, instead of chlorophyll, there was a molecule called retinol. Its pigments absorb yellow and green light and turn it into red and blue. So the Earth was more purple. And then there's a pink planet, GJ504b, far away from us, in the Virgo constellation, four times more massive than Jupiter. It's a newly formed exoplanet, around 160 million years old. By comparison, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. If we could go there, we would see an incredible world that glows from the heat of its formation. Everything around you would be colored magenta. Well, you're on a ship when you notice some water foaming nearby. It looks as if a huge vessel has just sunk there, but you don't see any debris. Steam is rising over the water, and large bubbles appear on the surface. In a couple of minutes, you see a small piece of land appear right in front of your eyes. It's releasing flames and lava. Millions of gallons of water evaporate in the mouth of the volcano. Frightened, you get away from this place. For the next three years, the small island covered with volcanoes will be slowly emerging from the water. Every day, it'll erupt and fill the sky with black ash. When the ash settles, it'll get mixed with the water and form the shore. This eruption lasted three years, and finally, by 1967, the island of Surtsey on the southern coast of Iceland was fully formed. Surtsey is one of the few islands that have emerged from the depth to the surface of the sea. But it's almost impossible to get here. The island has a unique ecological system, and scientists want to find out how it's going to develop without human influence. Only a few people from all over the world have permission to walk around the island. This next place looks unwelcome from afar. We're now in Australia, in the Tasman Sea. Here, a huge ridge resembling a sharp fin of a giant shark sticks out of the water. The height of this mountain is 1,800 feet, which is almost twice the height of the Eiffel Tower. This place is called Ball's Pyramid. It's located in the center of an uninhabited volcanic island. It's difficult to get here because of the inaccessible rocky landscape of the place. The island was first discovered in 1788. At that time, I wasn't around then. It was considered barren and devoid of life. But more than 200 years later, in 2001, a group of scientists arrived at the island, and they found some incredible creatures there. They accidentally discovered the rarest insect in the world. It happened when the researchers reached the island, climbed to the height of more than 100 feet, and spotted a bush. Under it, they saw a colony of bugs known as land lobsters, or walking sausages. These creatures belong to the family of stick insects. Each of them is about 6 inches in length. This is the length of a spicy bratwurst. Mmm, add a little mustard and relish? Yum! Oops, back to bugs. That day, people found 27 insects. But since then, their population has begun to increase. 
These creatures were believed to have become extinct in the early 20th century. But to the contrary, they somehow managed to get to the Ball's Pyramid and survive. Our next stop is Brazil, almost 93 miles from the center of Sao Paulo. That's where you can find an island that's almost impossible to get to. But if you succeed, you're unlikely to leave it. It's called Snake Island. There's no other place on the planet with such a high concentration of snakes. According to researchers, there are about 5 snakes for 10 square feet of land there. They are the only owners of the island, since no other animals can survive among them. Snakes there are one of the most venomous species in the world, the golden lanceheads. These snakes are about a foot and a half in length. Their venom is very powerful and fast-acting. If you let this reptile bite a raw piece of meat, the place around the bite will start to melt. Wow, count me out. Now, imagine you're on this island and the snakes don't bite you. The most interesting thing that you can find there is an old lighthouse. It's hidden in the dense foliage of trees. People lived on the island a long time ago. Rumor has it that the last keepers were in the lighthouse when snakes broke in. No one has lived there ever since. How these unique snakes appeared on the island is still a mystery. The most popular legend claims that a pirate came there a long time ago. He hid a treasure somewhere on the island. Then he left the snakes in the spot where the chest was hidden. The pirate hoped the reptiles would scare people away from his gold coins and jewelry. Since then, a few snakes have managed to increase their population thousands of times. And some of them, reportedly, are wearing jewelry. Nah, not really. If you ever wanted to get to the island for some reason, the patrol services would stop you. Only a few people in special protective suits can get there to conduct scientific research. The next island is located 17 miles south of the center of Mexico City. You can easily get here. There are no poisonous animals, nobody guards the place, and the island's landscape allows you to moor a boat. But most likely, you'll want to leave this place as soon as you walk there for a while, especially if you arrive at night. Dolls are hooked on trees all over the island. These toys have different clothes, different sizes, and different faces. You can find dozens of dolls on almost every tree. In the middle of the 20th century, one of the residents of Mexico City moved to this island and began to fill it with toys. He picked the dolls up from landfills and canals all over the island. It took him several decades to decorate each tree. In the beginning, it looked strange and interesting. Thousands of tourists came here to see the island. Then the dolls began to age and rot. Rains and hot sun deformed their faces. Covered with moss, they started to take terrible shapes. But the worst thing is that some people believe these dolls come to life at night. Imagine wandering alone on this island under the light of the moon and suddenly noticing a hanging doll without one eye. Ooh, It's turning its head in your direction. A second later, you're already jumping into the boat and sailing away as fast as possible. One of the most unsafe and inaccessible places on Earth is located in the waters of the Bay of Bengal. This is North Sentinel Island. It's a small piece of land that looks like a tropical paradise. But you won't get here for two reasons. Since 1956, any trips to this island have been prohibited by law. There are always several ships going around and patrolling the area. The second reason is located on the island itself. Imagine you've managed to get past the patrol boats. You're sailing on a small boat to the shore. Crystal clear water surrounds you. You can even notice passing fish and beautiful coral reefs. Ahead, you see the golden coast and bright green trees. And among them, you notice small dots. You get closer, and an arrow whizzes by a few inches away from your face. The next arrow is stuck in the wooden hull of the boat. The dots you noticed before are people, the local Sentinelese tribe. They're standing with bows, releasing arrows, and throwing spears at you. They are screaming something and waving their hands. You understand they are not happy to see you and will do everything to prevent you from reaching the shore. The Sentinelese have long been isolated from the whole world and are now defending their island in such an assertive way. They don't seem to be afraid of anything. Once, a helicopter flew to the island and the locals still threw their spears and shot arrows at it. It's forbidden to approach the place, not only because it's unsafe for tourists, 
but also to protect the local tribe from the dangers of civilizations. People from the continent can easily bring some disease to the island and infect its inhabitants. The locals don't have immunity, even from the flu or a simple cold. Never mind smartphones. In addition, the island is surrounded by a coral reef, and this makes it very difficult for large ships to reach the shore. Despite all the prohibitions and the danger, many people have tried to get to the island. In 1880, an officer got to the shore and discovered that the soil there was ideal for growing coconut palms. The man also found several villages on the island, but didn't dare to meet with the locals. Eventually, he left this place. Alive. Since then, many more attempts have been made to get to the island. Many times, researchers and travelers gave the islanders gifts, like fish or coconuts. The locals accepted these presents, asked for more, but still didn't allow foreigners to approach their homes. It's also difficult to make friends with the local tribe because they communicate in one of the most complex languages in the world. Scientists and linguists have been studying it for decades. And at the end of the 20th century, some researchers managed to make friends with the Sentinelese. In 1991, the islanders were invited to board a large ship. A team of anthropologists gave them bags with coconuts. Only several members of the tribe accepted the gifts. For centuries, the Sentinelese have been living on their own, far from civilization. And almost nobody wants to change this situation. What, and pass up the internet, fried food, and Facebook? You're kidding. Okay, this is how it starts. You're woken up by a strange sound. Not the alarm, though. It's 5 a.m. After a few seconds, you realize the strange sound is a knock on the window. But you live on the 12th floor. Who or what could be knocking? Window cleaners? You live in an ordinary apartment building, not a skyscraper with offices. The knocking is getting stronger. You muster up the courage and go to the window, reach for the curtain, and abruptly pull it aside. What you see is fantastic! There are flying or floating small fish outside your window. Thousands of them! A shoal of sardines rising directly to the sky. A few knock on your window as they pass. There are so many sardines, you can't see what's going on outside. But as the last fish flies by, the full picture opens before you. Large and small fish fly between the houses. Octopuses cut through the air with their tentacles into a rain cloud. A huge whale is slowly drifting toward the horizon. Above the roof of a nearby house, two sharks chase four sea lions. A neighbor waves to you. He holds a fishing rod from the window and waits for the fish to bite. A school, no, a flock of dolphins flies past your window. They cheerfully whistle as if they're greeting you. What's going on? You turn on the TV. All the channels are playing the same thing. Sea creatures of the Earth have learned to fly, leaving the ocean and filling the air. All flights worldwide are canceled, and fishing vessels are idle in the seas, oceans, lakes, and rivers. And no one knows what happened. Well, you get dressed and go outside. Sea turtles crawl on the ground. They shiver, flap their fins, and rise into the air. A flock of shrimp flies past you. Has the ocean lost its gravity? What happened to all the water? You live in a port town close to the sea, so you decide to go to the coast. You reach the shore and see the water is calm. Gravity seems to be intact. But the sea creatures continue to take to the air. Six months later, people gradually get used to the new natural phenomenon. Fish occupy most of the sky. Some sea creatures penetrate the middle layers of the atmosphere. Smaller birds have almost disappeared since the presence of predatory fish in the sky. But birds of prey that hunt fish gained weight. They've eaten so much that they can't fly anymore. Plump gulls, albatrosses, pelicans, and eagles can hardly walk and barely support themselves. Planes stop flying and ship travel increased. The world's ecosystem is completely changing. The ocean becomes lifeless. The number of bacteria, microbes, and various nutrients in the water move to the air. People get sick more often, and in some areas, it becomes difficult to breathe. When it rains, millions of shrimp and small fish 
fall to the ground along with the water. Many predatory mammals that have been feeding on fish begin to starve. They go out to the roads and cities to find food. Scientists research the flying creatures and find that they somehow change the structure of their lungs. But how fish got the ability to fly is still unknown. It seems nature just decided to push people out of their usual environment. Fishermen build balloons to fish in the sky. Some athletes throw a lasso at flying whales and ride them like huge horses. Though the landing can be difficult. Creatures that previously swam only in the very depths of the ocean settle at high altitudes. Researchers discover new, previously unknown fish species. From the ocean depths, a giant octopus rose into the air. Many call it the kraken. This monster has found a new home right on top of Mount Everest. Now everyone is afraid to climb this mountain. The most deep water creatures reach space. On the ISS, astronauts observe amazing animals flying past. They look like aliens from other planets, not Earth. In some areas, sharks descend to the ground for food. In these places, people are afraid to go out. Fishing companies buy huge Boeings and attach nets to it to catch fish in the air. But flights are not safe, especially when a whale suddenly appears smack dab in their path. Authorities impose curfews in many cities. People climb to the roofs and watch an incredible sight at night. Flying jellyfish floating in the air. Thanks to the bioluminescent protein in jellyfish, they glow. Stars in the sky mix with the neon transparent creatures. But be careful! Some of these jellyfish are very venomous. Some people were so fascinated by the beautiful jellyfishes that they touched them and ended up in the hospital. Squid, frightened by the new conditions, release ink into the air. When a lot of squids do this, the ink blots out the light from the sun. Massive traffic jams appear on the roads because electric eels fly through the streets and shock traffic lights. While all of humanity is looking up at the sky, almost no one has noticed what is happening down here. All over the world, people with a strange physical disability show up in hospitals. Weird holes form under people's ears. Doctors don't understand what they're dealing with. But then, one of the patients jumps into a lake, and it turns out he can breathe underwater. All people grow gills. At first, most people refuse to go underwater. But their changed lungs force them to do so, or spend the rest of their lives in a gas mask. Some people are happy to go under the water and start a new life. The human body adapts to the cold temperatures and high pressure. There is a lot of work ahead to create cities and infrastructure, but things are not so bad. There is more space in the water than on land. One year later, humanity begins to fully migrate to the oceans. But instead of a new life, they find trash, a lot of garbage. Billions of tons of plastic are floating in the water. Their new home turns out to be a massive dump that people have created. Global plastic recycling starts in all waters. Every day, people take out tons of trash from the ocean. The water is getting cleaner. Trash dumps appear on land. Five years later, water becomes cleaner. People don't live in garbage anymore. All the plastic is on land. As soon as the problem is solved, humanity begins to build underwater cities. But then all the fish start to fall into the seas and oceans. Everything returns to the usual way of life. People lose their gills, and now they're back on land. Sea creatures live in clean water once more. Philosophers and scientists from all over the world believe that in this way, nature has taught people a lesson. We understand how to live in a world of garbage and how we should care about our planet. People are making a considerable effort to preserve the planet's ecology. Waste recycling plants are built. Every person stops using plastic. Harmony begins between man and nature again. The sea. This unrelenting water beast has been defying all attempts to tame it for centuries. 
Many ships, driven by the wind, have gone through the harshest parts of the world. Some have survived the struggle with the sea, and many have come off second best. It's the year 1834. A ship called the Pilgrim is setting a course to sail from California to Boston. The journey will venture around South America and then past Cape Horn of Chile. Richard signs up as a merchant seaman aboard the Pilgrim. This is his first voyage at sea. The crew tells Richard stories of the Drake Passage off Cape Horn, a route that's legendary for its dangers. Countless ships and sailors have disappeared in those waters. Since Cape Horn's discovery in 1526, it's quickly become known to all those that have sailed around it as the ultimate test of any mariner's skill and of any ship's strength. Those that have survived the journey call Cape Horn a sailor's nightmare. Jack the Helmsman, a salty veteran, steers the ship towards this most dangerous of all routes. Jack has been aboard the Pilgrim since it was first commissioned in 1825. He's passed by the Horn many times, each time learning a different lesson from the tests provided by the sea. The Pilgrim has been refitted since its past voyage a year ago. Richard values Jack's experience, given that it's his first journey at sea. Jack assures Richard of his confidence in the Pilgrim, even though it's just a small wooden brig with two masts. Jack's aware that wooden vessels are gradually becoming outdated, replaced by new steam-powered ships. But Jack prefers the maneuverability of the Pilgrim and would take it over the steel ships any day. Richard is excited to be aboard. There's so much to explore in life as a merchant seaman, but the guy struggles to acquire his sea legs on the boat. Forceful winds make the Pilgrim move faster, providing Richard with a quick introduction to life at sea. At the same time, nothing can prepare him for what is to be experienced at Cape Horn. It's the southernmost point of land before Antarctica. The gap between the icy continent and Cape Horn holds the infamous Drake Passage, approximately 700 miles between Cape Horn and the Antarctic Peninsula. Strong winds provide an uninterrupted steadfast journey toward the Horn. But, as Jack tells Richard, the winds are more concentrated at the Drake Passage. They create a funneling effect, becoming stronger and more unpredictable. Richard is unsure of what this might mean for the Pilgrim, but understands that there's no easier route to travel around South America. A few days pass. The Pilgrim sails by the many islands that make up the western coast of Chile. Although the sea has been relatively calm, Richard continues to deal with his lack of sea legs. His movements are still not very graceful. The constant, ever-swaying deck rises and falls, and Richard finds it hard to get used to the motion. Random large waves hit the Pilgrim from every angle. The ship is quickly approaching Cape Horn. Richard looks towards great thunderous black clouds in the distance. Welcome to the Horn, Jack says, half laughing. A wry smile upon his face soon disappears. The man gets serious, knowing what awaits them all. Stronger winds start blowing the sails as the crew scrambles to hang onto the ropes. Richard desperately sets to adjust the aft sails, adjusting for the constant change in strong southerly winds. Jack holds firm at the helm, knowing the importance of his role. He's wary of the swell. It can build very quickly the further south they travel. It's crucial the Pilgrim doesn't venture too close to the Horn when they approach. The great darkness that was in the distance is now all around them, filling the sky in every direction. Blackened clouds throw rain and hail down at the crew as they try to resist the enraged weather. Jack is directed by the captain at the helm, changing the direction of the vessel. The temperature has dropped significantly. Barely keeping the water from his eyes, he turns toward the port side bow to provide his face a brief break from the torment of the wind. Looking out into the distance, the man sees the horn standing alone, surrounded by mist. It's a haunting sight. He steers the pilgrim along the face of the horn, the distance getting shorter. The waves shrink in height since the depths become shallower. But these waves are much steeper, and their angle can cause more damage to the wooden vessel. Jack's unsure how much of these waves the Pilgrim can take before the hull is breached. 
Richard, still posted at the aft sails, watches the water and icebergs floating by. He's unsure how large they actually are, since they're mostly hidden underwater. But he knows to alert Jack if any get too close. Just one iceberg hitting the Pilgrim will be all that the hull can withstand. Dutifully, he watches over the side and into the distance. Icebergs aren't the only thing to look out for. Rogue waves are common in these seas as well. The connecting Antarctic and Pacific Oceans, mixed with stormy weather, form waves together. This creates much larger rogue waves. Such waves have been known to reach up to 100 feet tall. They can destroy most vessels in their path. It'll surely be the end of the Pilgrim if it comes across a rogue wave. Strong currents adjust the route of the Pilgrim as though the horn is trying to lure the ship toward its rocky shallows. Slowly, they are getting pulled closer toward the horn. Jack is fighting the current at the helm. Spinning the wheel, he strains his body as much as he can. Grunting, he plunges the wheel from the port side to starboard and back again. The captain keeps yelling directions. To a novice, they're extremely confusing. But Jack, a hardened veteran, continues to interpret the directions with ease, steering to readjust their course away from the horn. The captain orders Richard to assess the hull below the decks. With the level of pounding the Drake Passage has provided so far, it's surely harmed the ship in some way. Richard runs to the deck as another sailor yells something at him, but the noise of the sea makes it difficult to hear. A wave hits the side, flowing onto the deck. Richard manages to hang on to the mast before he's almost swept overboard. The entire front deck seems to be underwater. Hanging on as the water rolls off the sides of the ship and waiting for it to clear, Richard watches the horn slowly go past. Still, it beckons toward the pilgrim, as though asking for its dues from the crew. The currents are still pulling the ship while the storm is raging on, with no end of the struggle in sight. The storm is growing ever larger and fiercer. Richard gathers himself to head below and assess the damage. After a slow descent to the lower decks, Richard can finally look over the hull from the ship's quarters. There's no damage from what he can gather. But he's shocked by the depth of the water inside. It's now at waist depth. Cups, amongst other things, float in the water. Even inside the ship, the guy can't escape the waves. Unable to make sense of it all, he stands frozen listening to the almighty power of Mother Nature outside. The sea roars even more wildly, waves constantly thudding against the hull. It sounds like a somber drumbeat, a slow countdown to the demise of the Pilgrim. Richard forces himself back to the terrors of the above decks, grasping onto the rails to carefully walk the slippery stairs. He leaves the disturbing creaks of the wooden decks, They're soon replaced with the strained sounds of the ropes, the yells of other sailors, and the deafening roar of the sea crashing all around him. Jack is at the helm, focused on his role, still fighting the wind and the waves, even with the addition of ice and frost. It seems that the world around him has set its heart to distract the man from his duty, but Jack pushes on determinedly. For nine days, the pilgrim fights the constant changes in stormy weather, facing all kinds of obstacles, but the ship manages to make it through. As they leave the storm behind, the crew sets their course north for their final destination. The sight of the sun peeking through the dark clouds is the most relieving thing Richard has ever experienced. Unfortunately, Richard lost his rations at some stage during the storm. At sea, if your rations are lost, it's your own bad luck. Luckily, Jack is kind enough to share some of his. Now, if you step on a sea urchin, you're going to know right away. (laughs) Look at those spikes. Get the point? (laughs) Ow! While they're not aggressive, they've got a great defense going against any creatures that want to eat them. Venomous spikes and a poisonous bite. (laughs) Pick your poison, literally. They live in all of the oceans of the world, so avoiding them is out of the question. They mostly hang out in shallow water, hiding in rock pools and reefs, so unmindful people step on them a lot. The long, venomous spikes of the urchin look like needles. Feel like them, too. They can go in quite deep, 
plus they release a strong toxin. The cure? Remove the spikes quickly and wash with salt water. One small marine mammal just loves sea urchins. Any guesses? It's the sea otter. Don't let its cuteness get in the way of its toughness. Mm. These mammals rarely leave the water, and that even includes taking naps. Holding hands with other otters keeps them from floating away from the pack. Their fur is the densest on the planet, up to a million hairs per square inch. Hey, we humans only have about 2,000. They're also good with tools. They can use rocks to hammer open shells. Hey, how else would you open a sea urchin? You ought to try it sometime. <laughs> Stonefish aren't going to win any beauty contest unless the pageant is for best rock lookalike. Their tiny, unreflective eyes and rough skin blend in perfectly with their environment. A large head, an even bigger mouth, and a home full of… yeah, it's rocks. And just because you're on the beach doesn't mean you're safe. Stonefish can survive for 24 hours out of the water. Stepping on one or even handling one won't be that fun. Their dorsal fin spines have extremely strong venom. It shoots out when they get stepped on and it can lead to paralysis or even heart failure. You'll need help fast! No wonder they're one of the most dangerous creatures in the water or anywhere. Be careful when scrambling around rocky areas. They love to play hide and seek. Box jellyfish tentacles grow up to 10 feet long, and each tentacle has 5,000 stinging cells. Not bad for a creature that's mostly just water. Their venom is strong enough to paralyze anything they want to eat. Now, if you happen to get stung, it's going to hurt. A lot! Its toxins contain proteins that affect the heart, skin cells, and even our nervous system. No wonder it's considered one of the most dangerous creatures on the planet. I wouldn't recommend using sunscreen, soda, coffee, or other older methods. They don't work. Your best bet is some good old-fashioned seawater. Looks like jellyfish are the rulers of the ocean, not sharks. Hey, look around your local rock pool. You might see this sweet little octopus. It's tiny and has blue rings. Cute! But don't fall for it now. This octopus wouldn't make a good pet. When provoked, the octopus will start flashing neon blue to warn everyone to stay away. And I highly recommend you do just that. Their venom is a thousand times more dangerous than cyanide. There's also no known antidote for it. The best thing to do? Take a quick picture and walk away. Better yet, just walk away. Now, not even the octopuses are normal down under. I'll stick with my shrimp on the bar, if you may. Do you see that large log near the ocean floor? Maybe it's part of an old ship, a treasure, gold, diamonds. Hey, I'm rich! As you get closer, you notice something. It's swimming! It's not a shark or a dolphin. It's a saltwater crocodile. Now, don't panic. If you bump into one of these reptiles in the sea, it's unlikely it'll think of you as food. Crocodiles have a special valve in their throat that stops them from drowning underwater, but that doesn't mean they can't bite. Usually, they're heading to a nearby island, and the quickest way there is to body surf. They can't really take the ferry. Watching one from a distance should be okay, just don't swim to shore right away. They love to ambush their lunch in the shallow water. If there's one time I'd like to see a great white shark, it's when I'm diving with crocodiles. They'll gladly take a crocodile-sized nibble, given the right motivation. Going out on a boat off the coast of Mexico sounds like the perfect vacation. The sun, the blue water, the most endangered sea creature… Wait, what? The vaquita isn't dangerous, but don't expect it to stick around to say hello or sign any autographs. It's incredibly shy. This little cow, that's what the Spanish means, is one tiny sea mammal. With those black markings around its eyes, it looks more like a sea panda to me. Seeing one should make you feel very special. They're on the brink of extinction, mostly because they get caught up by accident in fishing nets. It's estimated that there are only 10 left in the wild. The Galapagos Islands are legendary. Giant tortoises, blue-footed bobbies, Sally Lightfoot crabs, and red-lipped batfish. But if you've ever swum around there, you might have seen something really unexpected in the water. Iguanas! Everywhere! These large marine reptiles eat the algae that grow on underwater rocks. 
they're strictly vegetarians. Yeah, I'll bet the fish are happy about that. A long, flat tail designed for swimming helps them move around, and sharp claws keep them on the rocks for their daily sunbathing sessions. But watch them closely. They sneeze a lot. They haven't got a cold or anything. They're sneezing out salt. A special gland keeps the salt out of their nose, and they've got to get rid of it somehow. Ooh, sounds painful. What's cool is that they don't mind us in the water with them. Because the islands have been so isolated, the creatures here aren't afraid of humans. Now, if picking up shells on the beach is something you like doing, make sure the shell you collect doesn't already have an owner. Snails are everywhere in this world, and they're mostly harmless to the touch. But there's always one, ruining it for everybody. Trust me, the cone snail is nothing like its land-based brothers. It's not vegetarian. There are over 500 species of this venomous sea creature, with a few that can really hurt you. These little snails are extremely vicious. They inject their venom through a harpoon-like tooth. And they don't even floss. They're capable of paralysis, blindness, lung failure, and even worse. Best give some respect to your backyard snails. You don't want them calling this thing in as a backup. Want to high-five a sea creature? Well, put your flipper, I mean hand, up for the Tasmanian red handfish. This fish doesn't swim like a fish. It walks. It uses its flipper-like hands to stroll around on the ocean floor. These bottom walkers are disturbed by swimmers and boats a lot. Some people even want to take them home as pets. I think it's better to just give them a wave and swim on by. If you think starfish love getting their photo taken, does that mean you can communicate with starfish? If you could, this one would ask you to leave it alone. It's always grumpy. Unlike its washed-up relatives on the seashore, the crown of thorn starfish is large and dangerous. These creatures occur naturally on coral, like the Great Barrier Reef. Their venom's terrifying, even for humans. This sea creature is covered in poisonous spines that cause intense and immediate pain. It can last longer than three hours. So, what happens if you rub one of these things the wrong way? Nausea and vomiting. Not exactly ideal for getting that perfect Instagram pic. Pufferfish may look small and cute, but handle them wrong and it's game over. They're a huge hit at underwater birthday parties the world over. They can turn themselves into balloons. Funnily enough, not all pufferfish are venomous with sharp spikes. Some are smooth and adorable. But the nasty ones have a highly toxic substance inside their body. Which is weird, because you could pay up to 50 bucks for it at a restaurant. You ever heard of the Japanese delicacy fugu? It's venomous pufferfish on a plate. Young chefs spend years training to prepare it. But one wrong cut, and you can bet that customer won't be coming back. Ever. Sharks are the only animal immune to pufferfish toxin. Great. Another thing that makes sharks awesome.